he actually uses scripture more than we've had so far. Uh, yeah, <laughs> leave it to our wayward Lutheran brethren to uh, actually actually go to scripture, but use it really badly. Oh, just, <laughs> just horrible. It's it's like we're taking a, a, a the last train to Crazyville. <laughs> Pistols, Prayer, and Potluck. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. Hey folks, welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competitive shooting, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode number 325. Thank you all so much for making Armed Lutheran Radio a part of your week again this week. For those of you who are returning... Thank you for coming back and spending another week with us. For those of you who are new, welcome aboard. I hope you will. Um, I hope you enjoy what you hear today, and I hope you will come back for more next week. What you're going to get today is what we call a variety show. For those of you who are new, that means we have content from the entire cast: Mia Anstein, Sergeant Bill Sylvia, and Pastor John Bennett. Haven't gotten the whole gang together in a while, so it's good to have um, content from everyone. I know you guys look forward to that, and I certainly do appreciate their contributions to the show, as always. Before we get started, I do want to remind you this show, like all of our episodes, is made possible by the men and women of the Reformation Gun Club. Today, I want to recognize some awesome people. Kevin from Fairfax, Missouri. Dan from Indian Trail, North Carolina, one of the regulars at our monthly online hangouts. Kevin from Marion, Iowa. Vincent from Tulare, California. John from Spokane, Washington. Tony from Little Elm, Texas. Eric from Buckeye, Ohio. Our good friend Calroy from Boron, California. Frank from Lake City, Michigan. Catherine from Casper, Wyoming. And our newest member, Russell from Trenton, North Carolina. Thank you all so much for your support, and thank you to all of the members of the Reformation Gun Club. These people put their money where their mouth is. They appreciate the the work that we put into the show. They appreciate the content that we provide every week, and they'd like to see it continue. And if you would like to, um, to join them, you can do that and take advantage of all the great benefits that come with being a member. Uh, you get access to you get early access to the show every week. You get access to our awesome website with hundreds of hours of exclusive content. Um, you get invitations to our monthly online hangouts. Um, one of those is coming up not too long from now, and probably in the next couple of weeks. Probably not next weekend, but the weekend after that, I think, is probably more likely. Uh, so we do those once once a month. We just hang out with the uh, members of the of the gun club, shoot the breeze, talk about current events and what's going on in our lives and gun stuff, and uh, it's a it's a lot of fun. And I hope you will consider joining these good people and supporting the show. You also get the satisfaction of knowing that you made all this possible by becoming a member for as little as fifteen seventeen. That's a little insider joke for us Lutherans. 15 17 per year um and uh check it out armedlutheran.us slash gun club check out all the membership levels the benefits and come join us i really do appreciate all of our members and i hope you will uh i hope you will check it out and i hope you will join them all right as i said this week is a variety show we've got content from the entire cast so i'm i've done a lot of rambling over the last few weeks a lot of talking and a lot of kind of hogging the airwaves. So this week, it's all about my awesome cast. But for, before I get to that, just a really quick reminder. We have a new book coming in December, if you did not uh, hear the announcement a couple of weeks ago. It is the second edition of the book, Duty to Defend. 
and I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of the book or who have not read it, who have not don't know what I'm talking about, Duty to Defend is a collection of essays from Lutheran pastors from all over the country. We take the most common and sometimes the most uncommon arguments, um, the verses from Scripture that are used in the gun rights debate, both for and against um, gun control, and um, for and against gun rights. And the pastors take those passages and put them in proper context and explain to you whether or not that use of the, of the, the verse in question is a good one or not, why it fits or why it does not why it's being misused or, or whether or not it's being used properly. It, 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 the first book was fantastic, um, but this time we've got uh, a dozen, I think it's uh, 12 new articles uh, to add to the collection from the first book. So nothing's being cut from the first book in this second edition. You get all of the content from the first book plus 12, it's at least 12, I'm working on the possibility there might be a 13th coming, uh, 12 new articles from seven new pastors, um, new features, better formatting, um, a better editor, and a pretty awesome book cover, if I do say so myself. We unveiled that uh, a few uh, weeks back at our um, July online hangout. And uh, so if you have not considered, or if you've not gotten the book, if you've considered getting it, um, and you just haven't pulled the trigger yet, I would suggest, I'm always happy if you buy my book, but I would suggest if you haven't bought the first one and you're considering it, I would wait for the second one. If you can't wait, that's fine. It's still on sale, the first edition, but the second the second edition is coming in December. It's Available right now for pre-order at armedlutheran.us slash duty. Uh, and it's if you don't buy the first one or if you haven't got the first one, it's worth the wait. Uh, trust me, it's it's just going to be fantastic. I'm really excited about it. As you can tell, I've been I found time this week finally to get some editing done. Um, got most of the content turned in at this point. I'm still waiting for a few articles. Not going to call out any names at this point. But um, I've got a few more articles coming and even started talking to another pastor about another one, maybe a 13th article. I uh, might start working on that next week as well. So I'm really stoked, really excited about the book. It's going to be close to 300 pages this time. So I think, let me grab my copy of the first edition. The first edition was like 193 pages. Uh, we're at least a hundred more pages in the second edition. So it's, it's 50%. It's 50% larger than the original. So uh, check it out. Armedlutheran.us slash duty and, um, and pre-order your copy today. Okay. Time now for Mia's motivations with Mia Einstein. Hey guys, it's Mia Ann Stein visiting with you again. I hope you're all doing well. I am super busy this summer and been traveling a little, most of the time that's solo. And I know I've given you some tips and advice about safety while you're traveling in the past because being on the road, you definitely experience some odd things. But during one of my trips, I actually was presented with a scenario that had happened to a very good friend of mine and I was actually in the vicinity but was 100% unaware of what had happened. So let me give you a little breakdown to this story. This happened in a an area where we were in a gun-free area. We did not have firearms and I had my hotel room and my friend, she had her hotel room and I had asked her if she wanted a room together because my roommate had left and no, no, it's okay because she had lots of work to do. Being in the line of business that we are in, you often are working late at night and stuff like that, which wouldn't have bothered me, but I understood. That evening, we were supposed to go to a dinner and for some reason, 
I was not comfortable. I did not feel safe. I was very uneasy. When I stay in a hotel, I barricade the hotel doors. I hope you do this as well. You do have to understand your barricades. So in the event of the need of escape of your hotel room, you can do that efficiently as well. However, this evening I barricaded my door. The hotel room also had a sliding glass door, so I had barred that as well. There's always things you can do to make these things happen, so keep them in mind. And when you're carrying things, when you travel, keep that in mind. I generally travel with only a carry-on bag, so what you bring is limited. But you have to consider that. Do you want to lose your bags and not have what you need for work, stuff like that? Or are you able to carry some things? So back to the story. I had barred myself in my hotel room. I ate granola bars and snacks. I always have uh, survival food. <laughs> and I had just kind of chilled out and did work that evening. Stayed in my, locked in my hotel room. I missed out on the big dinner. And, you know, I was okay with that. I didn't mind not going to dinner. Well, two years later, I'm at this event just a month ago. And... The other lady whom I had asked, do you want a room together because there's more safety in numbers? And she was busy. Well, evidently, she had went to leave her hotel room. She's very upset because she said, I didn't look out the peephole, so I didn't know someone was out there. I want to tell you, if you're going to look out a peephole, we've done this as children when we were in high school sports. So you can actually lean against the wall to the side of the door and nobody's going to see you. So yeah, look out the peephole, but know that you're not always going to see everything that's there. So keep that in mind. She was upset because she didn't look out the peephole. She feels like this was a mistake she made. Yeah, yes and no. She walked out of the hotel room. She was on the phone with her husband. As she stepped out and went to pull the door closed because the automatic hinges weren't working to make that self-closer close the door, she reached to pull the door closed and a gentleman slammed her against the wall. And she's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, or I don't know exactly what words she said. I am recounting the story secondhand. As she's yelling or in excitement, she looks over and there is a large German shepherd in down ready position. Fortunately, this young lady, she's on the phone with her husband. Her husband actually was thousands of miles away or hundreds of miles away. And he says, I'm getting in the elevator. I'm almost there. To which the man that had slammed her was like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just throwing my ball for my dog. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And let her go. She proceeded to the elevator, got the heck out of there. My question to you is what would you do in this scenario? What things would you have done differently? Okay, look out the peephole. What else could you have done differently? You could not carry a firearm. What are some things that you can carry for self-defense? These are things that you must think of. And these are things that I try to think of, but this scenario caught me off guard like you cannot believe. It blew my mind. It blew my mind because it just brought chills through my spine as she told me the story. Because if you haven't read The Gift of Fear, please order that book. I will give Lloyd a link to put in the show notes. Get The Gift of Fear. This book is very good and it's a start. It's it's something that is very helpful. My gift of fear kept me locked in that hotel room that night. Maybe the gentleman had been in my hallway. I don't know. I was on a different floor. But something told me that I didn't need to go and be social that night and have supper. A granola bar was fine for dinner. Think about that for a second. Hmm, what was telling me? I believe that God speaks to us in different ways. And I believe that you can call it the guardian angel, whatever you want to call it. Something told me that night my fear was a gift and I stayed locked in my room. Had I gone out of the room and had this, had I been that young lady, some things that you can carry that if I had only my carry on bag, you can carry your water bottle, your canteen, those metal ones, not the plastic ones, carry a metal one, carry the ones that have the handle on the lid where you can swing and use those for striking. That's something you can carry. I do want you to be aware that you'll need to check airline guidelines for carry-on bags. Obviously, I can't carry many things in carry-on, but also for what you're allowed to check on your checked luggage. 
Something else that I have often carried is a tactical pen, and I carry those in a bra strap. I carry them not while I'm flying, but when I get to my destination, I'll put those in a bra strap. I will put them in my pocket. I'll put them in a belt loop in a place where I can get easy access. These are things that you might try to carry. I've also recently been ordering some taser devices and flashlights. I don't think had the gentleman slammed you against the wall, I don't think a flashlight at that point is going to help unless you have a tactical flashlight. And a tactical flashlight is a heavy flashlight that has more of a jagged edge around the light, so it's helpful for striking and can do some damage. You can also get tactical necklaces. That's something I wouldn't be able to carry on the plane because it specifically does look like a weapon and they probably would take that from you on a carry-on. However, maybe this is something I'm thinking, maybe I need to start checking a bag and getting these devices so I can carry them around in locations where I'm able And that's something in some of my trips, I have to go through metal detectors and I'm specifically thinking of Washington DC because I'm preparing to head there. And what can I carry for safety and still make it into a Senate house building with something for self-defense? So I would like to know what ideas you have. I would like to know your advice about scenarios and self-defense because I try to bring awareness, but I don't have every answer. And as I said, this story completely, it hit me in the gut and took my breath away. I'm not sure with a German Shepherd. My aunt has a German Shepherd that is her personal protection dog, and he weighs more than me. So yes, I've had hand-to-hand with people, but I've also, if you've ever done self-defense and like been the guinea pig for a, a dog that's been in training, they are fierce and they have so much strength. So what would you do if a German Shepherd and a man were on the attack? Whether you're a man or a woman, something to consider. World is crazy out there. I hope you all are staying safe. Let me know what you think and give me your tips in the comments over at the Reformation Gun Club. Talk to you next time. Bye guys. You can read more from Mia, watch her YouTube videos, or check out her podcast, Mac Outdoors with Mia and Leah, at miaanstein.com. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, I'm Sergeant Bill, and this is your Ballistic Minute. Today I want to talk to you about a retune, getting back in the saddle, a million different phrases but basically just starting to get back into shooting so maybe you've had a big break after covid or maybe you've had an injury or illness or just something that kept you from shooting going to the range shooting matches whatever how do you get back into it you've been off for a while you're going to be rusty and you're going to have expectations of the way you used to shoot if you were a competitive shooter before these are all things that we can manage and deal with okay so you want to start slow And by starting slow, I mean do dry fire and dry fire only. Do draws and maybe reloads. Maybe once or twice a week for about 10 minutes each session. That's not a whole lot. That's just going to get you back into it. And it's enough to make it interesting without being too much work. Don't go to the range right away and think, I'm just going to go blast and see how I do or go shoot a match because it'll just discourage you. You won't be shooting at the level you were before because shooting especially pistol shooting is a perishable skill so if you haven't been practicing or if you haven't been out to the range and done any live fire or matches you're not going to be where you were or where you want to be in those two dry fire sessions while you're doing your draws and your reloads you need to really really concentrate on the basics work on your grip work on your sight alignment and work on your trigger press Now, the grip, making sure you're gripping the gun properly and gripping it strong enough with your weak hand and et cetera so that when you do work the trigger, it's not moving the gun. Your sight alignment goes along with that. Once you've got a good grip, you can start doing some trigger presses and really get to know the trigger and know where it's going to break and how it's going to break and what it's going to do to your sight alignment. And you can do this all in dry fire, just slow trigger presses at a target 
and then you can speed it up. One of the really good drills that I've done is you take a shot timer and you set it to beep and at like, say, 0.5 seconds or 0.8 seconds or even one second. So you're standing there, you're on the target, your finger's on the trigger, and it beeps and you try to press trigger as quickly without moving the sights as you can. The more you do that, the more you see what it's going to do. Now, if you've got a red dot pistol, you really see what your trigger press is doing to your sight alignment and maybe what your grip is doing to all that. So pay attention, focus on those basics, and it'll start coming back to you. Not only will it start coming back to you, but if you start enjoying it again, it's fun. So if you make it fun, not work, it's something you'll want to do again. So after a few weeks, you can up those dry fire sessions to 20 minutes and maybe a second or third or fourth one during the week. And then maybe even go to the range. Keep your expectations low. Start out shooting some groups nice and slow, working the grip and trigger press, side alignment, and you know just trying to make good shots. And then speed it up as you go and work some other stuff. If you don't have a range where you can do that, after a few weeks of dry fire, Go to a match. Go to a local IDPA match and just go with extremely low or no expectations. Just say, hey, I'm going to go have fun. I'm going to be safe. And however I shoot, however I shoot, I'm going to learn from it. This is something we should be doing all the time, even though we don't. And I know because I'm guilty of it. But you'll have more fun. You'll want to dry fire more. And you'll want to spend a little bit of money on that expensive ammo that's hard to find to go out to the matches and shoot. All right, I know a lot of people are going, well, come on, Sergeant Bill, what's a quick, easy way we can get better and be interested and want to do dry fire again? Well, the honest truth is buy something new. Now, you don't have to go out and buy a new gun or anything like that, but if you buy something simple like a new mag plates for your magazine or or um, a new holster or maybe some dry fire targets, you it's something new. It'll help to rekindle that interest and get you invigorated to go back and dry fire more. And then go to a match and shoot and do a little bit better and, you know, keep that cycle going. So to be perfectly honest with you guys, I haven't had any primers or anything to reload in probably a year and a half or more at this point. I haven't shot a whole lot of matches in the last six to eight months, but I still go and shoot. I still dry fire probably once, sometimes twice a week for 15, 20 minutes. And I am doing, like I said, I'm doing it more with my concealed carry gun or my duty gun. Because those guns, even though they're not as fun to shoot as some of my more competition-based guns, they're more applicable. They're harder. So if I can keep a good grip, good trigger press and sight alignment on a Glock 19, then with a stock trigger and all that kind of stuff, it makes shooting a tricked-out competition gun with a heavy frame, you know, uh, SIG 320 Legion or something like that with a dot on it, that much easier and that much more fun. So take a couple minutes out of the day, do some dry fire, work those basics, get that interest back up, keep on shooting, keep on practicing. I'm Sergeant Bill. This has been your Ballistic Minute. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Force and a masterclass competitive shooter. You can check out his YouTube videos at armedlutheran.us slash Sergeant Bill. It's time for Pastoral Pontifications with Pastor John Bennett. Greetings, my fellow Christian nationalists. This is the Pistol Packing Padre, Pastor John Bennett, here to do a little bit of pontificating. And as we look at the world around us and recent developments in politics and in our country, there certainly is a lot to pontificate about today. Now, the first thing that I want to say is that the raid on Mar-a-Lago last Monday should be absolute evidence to us that the world that we live in, freedom, it is just an illusion. We may think we're free, and certainly there are some trappings of liberty that we see in our world. But if they can do this to a former sitting president as purely a political attack, they can do the same to us. We see how this erosion of our liberty is 
is boldly demonstrated by the FBI raid at Mar-a-Lago. And if you look at everything that's led up to this, there was absolutely no justification for this whatsoever. Back in June, on I believe it was June 3rd, Trump had welcomed the FBI into his home in compliance with the subpoena. He sent them with something like 15 boxes of records, all in compliance with the Presidential Records Act, which prohibits past presidents from holding on to anything that's been classified. And here's the kicker. The president, he has the authority to classify or declassify documents. So in reality, this is a stupid act, and many have questioned whether or not it's constitutional in the first place. Also at that same time, the Secret Service installed a lock in the storage area on the property, which was for the purpose of making sure the records that were still there were even more secure. So you have a very compliant president, or former president, I should say. This would insinuate them with with this raid that just took place, that the Secret Service were also complicit in hiding these documents that supposedly it was necessary for the FBI to show up in a raid to seize. It's also very suspicious that just a few days earlier, on August 5th, it was revealed that Biden had met with two executives of, of the same Chinese energy company in the West Wing, the company with which Hunter Biden had strong ties, the same company who had given a large sum of money to Hunter's fraudulent corporation. And we have that email from the Biden laptop that, or the Hunter's laptop that said 10% held by H for the big guy. Gee, who could that be? There is also many rumors based on social media posts by Trump that he was going to announce on August 8th that he was going to be running for president in 2024. Just so happens that the raid takes place on the same day. I'm sure that's not a coincidence. Add to this the bill that was recently passed thanks to jokers like Joe Manchin and Krista Sinema who pretended that they were moderates, a bill that hires 87,000 new IRS agents for the purpose of enforcing tax law. Yeah, that's not done in order to, to secure liberty. All of this is done to further infringe upon our liberties. And it's obvious, it should be obvious, that we are no longer living in a free world. And because you no longer live in a free world, we have to be careful of our response then to the increasing tyranny that we see taking place. So I'm going to shift gears here now, and I hinted at where I'm going next with my opening words. A few months ago, we began hearing a brand new term that I had never heard before, being uttered by the miscreants in the media, the term Christian nationalists. And this term really has one purpose and one purpose only. It is to malign and demonize conservative Christians. We see the roots of phrases like this going back to Obama, who described those who opposed him as bitter and they cling to guns or religion or antipathy towards people who aren't like them. Those were his exact words. Those also were the words that were the inspiration for the segment that Lloyd and I do, Clinging to God and Guns. All this is to demonize political opponents. We see these efforts by the godless degenerates who are in positions of power to brand conservative Christians as racists and as a danger to the safety of the public. This phrase, Christian nationalist, is used to describe any Christian who holds to the Bible as the Word of God and considers the Word of God as defining what is right and true and moral. Bible-believing Christians who reject the amorality that is promoted by a secular society. Things like same-sex marriage, the transgender movement, abortion, and the like. I'd also like to point out that the use of the word nationalist is very intentional. If we look at the recent past, what has that word nationalist been used in conjunction with most of the time? That term, white nationalists. 
This is an attempt to lump us in with white supremacists. And think of it this way. If you can convince those people who are sitting on the fence when it comes to their political persuasions, if you can convince the radical left that we are racists, that we are a bad people who present a danger to the general public, then it becomes a whole lot easier to discredit us and, if possible, eliminate us. Do not have any doubts about this. That is their intention. If they could, they would remove us from society by any means necessary. So please take me seriously when I say that their intention is to malign and marginalize people of faith so that when the time comes to begin actively persecuting Christians, they will have the support of the general public. Now I pray to God this is hundreds of years down the road when I and my children are long gone, but we shouldn't be surprised when it starts to happen. We see how in some churches, and I use that term churches quite loosely, how they malign faithful Christians as unloving bigots if a Christian dare to reject leftism. I just saw a meme the other day which took that old illustration that you have probably seen of a Jewish man painting the blood of the lamb over the door at Passover. And in this meme instead he's painting a rainbow over the door along with the logos of various organizations like Black Lives Matter along with a caption that says something to the effect of Corporations avoiding raids by FBI and IRS. Well, I think we could accurately add so-called Christians and so-called Christian churches to this as well. We've seen this for a while, how so many have jumped on the woke bandwagon so they can sit at the proverbial lunch table with all the cool kids, while at the same time demonizing people like ourselves who wish to remain faithful to God's word. St. Peter writes in his first letter, chapter 4, Live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Now, while this was an epistle to all Christians, I believe that this is specifically towards those who were converts to the Christian faith, because it speaks of living according to the human passions as something that is in the past tense. Peter goes on, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. And here's the key verse. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debaucheries, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. It should be no surprise to us when we suffer persecution for rejecting the immorality that has become commonplace and even celebrated in our secular society. St. John in his first epistle says that we should not be surprised if the world hates us. And we could add to the world those so-called Christian churches, pseudo-Christian churches, which promote leftism while demonizing those who remain faithful to the word of God. We should not be surprised when we are maligned and persecuted, but the question is, how do we respond? Now, as we all know, the internet happens to be a source of all the world's stupidity, and in preparing for my contribution to what will be included in the upcoming second edition release of Duty to Defend, I came across a terrible article on an equally terrible blog site, The Decolonized Christian. Now, for this blog, nowhere does the author reveal their name, but I did a little DNS lookup. I looked up the guy's name, and it turns out he is some Canadian who fancies himself a Christian music artist who blathers endlessly on his blog about how horrible traditional Christians are and how wonderful socialism is and how Christianity in the Middle Ages was really bad because it, quote-unquote, colonized the world by taking the gospel and with it Western ideology and how the church has to now somehow decolonize whatever the heck that's supposed to mean because Christianity is too white. Well, I hate to break it to this nitwit, but the place where the gospel is spreading the fastest is in Africa where white missionaries are taking the gospel to impoverished and destitute black people and how their lives have become better for it. Anyways, not to get ahead of myself, 
In an article titled, Jesus or Caesar, the Way of Nonviolent Resistance, this guy comments on Jesus' instructions to turn the other cheek, and he quotes some other pseudo-intellectual nitwit who claims that back in those days, the right hand was used for clean things and the left hand was used for unclean things, like wiping yourself after using the restroom, and that a person would hit with their backhanded slap as a way of insulting, so if you were to hit on the left cheek, a person would be using their left hand. Now, there is absolutely no historical proof of this whatsoever. There isn't much evidence, aside from uh, Muslim-majority cultures, that a person used a bare hand to wipe their rear. In fact, in Jewish society, if you did this sort of a thing, it would make you unclean and exclude you from the worship life of Israel until you had ceremonially bathed yourself. This is just another example of a person digging for some dribble to support their claim that if Jesus walked the earth today, he would have been some woke socialist. Anyhow, let's see if you can make any sense of what this narcissistic Canadian is writing. He says, In a Greco-Roman context, turning the other cheek gave subversive power to the offended, for it meant that the offender, who was lording power over the offended, was being challenged by the offended to strike again, this time with their unclean left hand, which would prove the injustice of the offender's actions if acted upon. This quote-unquote challenge granted the offended person power over the offender in that moment. Rather than cowering away or submitting in fear, the offended now has regained their humanity and reclaimed some of their dignity. In this way, Jesus creatively gave his followers, colonized Jews living under Roman occupation, gave back their dignity, empowering them to act nonviolently toward their oppressors in a world that continued to exploit and dehumanize them. In this way, third way nonviolent resistance can strategically subvert the empire, revealing the folly, injustice, and violence of the empire's own systems. Well, if you made any sense of that, please put the bong down and slowly step away. The best I can figure out is that when Jesus instructed his followers to not return an insult for an insult, what he really meant is that by turning the other cheek, you were being defiant to your abuser as a means of nonviolent resistance, which somehow would bring the empire to its knees. He insinuates that being armed isn't the way, but rather, you have to be a squishy doormat to change the world. Yes, that'll show, and that'll really get those evil authoritarians down on their knees. Makes absolutely no sense at all, but this is the way that woke, quote-unquote woke, quote-unquote Christians think. Now, it took a long way around this, but ideas like this, that the voluntary disarmament of private citizens is somehow the response that we ought to have when our own government and the political elitists brand us as a danger to society, and that this is what Jesus demands of us, this is absolute blatant stupidity and ignorance. So what is the Christian response? While we shouldn't be surprised if we are persecuted for our confession in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, crucified and risen again, and as St. John states in his first epistle, that we should rejoice if we share in Christ's sufferings at the present time, and I believe for the foreseeable future, we are not being maligned because of our confession of faith. Now that's just being lumped in there, but the truth is that a lot of people who are Christians who are even sincere in their faith, at least in their own minds, they believe in Jesus as the Son of God, but they also embrace liberalism. Notice that they aren't being targeted. No, we're not being targeted because of our religious convictions, although we can always argue that our political convictions are informed by our faith. No, we are being targeted because of our political convictions. The establishment sees us as a threat to their power, and influence. Now, if we understand the scriptures properly, especially the New Testament, we understand that we shouldn't shy away from suffering for the gospel. But what we're facing right now in this country isn't that. We aren't facing persecution, at least for the moment, in a biblical way, a biblical perspective, the persecution of our faith, but rather what we are facing right now is political persecution. And this is why Trump's residence was raided. 
This is why 87,000 more IRS agents are going to be hired. This is why they are woke of in the military. Why they are pushing for universal background checks, which is a backdoor way of creating a registry of gun owners in the United States. All of this comes down to one thing only. It is about the left's lust for power and their insistence of bringing us to heel and punishing us into submission. So understand that this is the ideological oppression that we're presently facing, and I believe it's just going to get worse. Now, from an ideological perspective, we are opposed to any efforts to further liberalize our society. Our society is already liberal enough, and we need to start rolling back the tide on this. But what is to be our physical active response as Christians? Now, you don't have to look terribly hard to find people who simply aren't as smart as they think they are trying to talk about things like active versus passive resistance. And if you ever hear some so-called conservative utter such nonsense, be sure to sternly correct them. Passive resistance means doing absolutely nothing. The response is a differentiation between aggressive versus defensive resistance. We always talk about self-defense, not proactive aggression. We don't go out and commit an act of violence proactively to stop someone from possibly doing something to us. That's not the way it works. When a threat presents itself, we act accordingly. Right now, the attacks that we are facing are against our liberty, against people of faith, and in many ways, this is ideological impunitive. They want to use things like the court system to inflict a legal process that is punishing to the individual, especially if they can't afford a decent legal defense. This is why there's a push for these red flag laws. As to that recent bill that was just passed, that's supposed to fund the IRS to the tune of $80 billion, don't believe for a second that this is about making sure the rich pay their taxes, because historically audits have been leveled more heavily against the middle class who typically can't afford to pay both a fancy lawyer and whatever the IRS is asking in retribution, so they just end up paying the IRS whatever they say they owe and be done with it. Remember the IRS under Barack Obama, how Lois Lerner weaponized that branch of the government to target Obama's political enemies? All of this is about political persecution. But when Jack Buddha government thugs step up and start inflicting physical losses, our first response shouldn't be to show aggression, but to act responsibly using whatever defensive tools we have available to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our neighbors. We need to do things like making good use of the legal system to protect our assets. This is why my wife and I are both members of the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. We want to make sure that if we're ever accused of a gun-related crime, that we have the means to defend ourselves so our children won't have to suffer as a consequence. There's other actions that a person can take, like placing their assets in an independent trust that is then passed down to beneficiaries, so that if you're being accused of some crime where government actors can seize your assets, if those assets are locked up in a trust, it provides some legal cover so that you can hand those assets down to your loved ones. But when it comes to using lethal force, it is only done when absolutely necessary, only as a defensive means to preserve our life, the life of our loved ones, the life of our neighbor. No matter how intelligent a person tries to sound in trying to convince you that Real Christians would lay down their arms and not resist tyranny. Remember that there is no prohibition in Scripture to self-defense. Rather, we are called to love our neighbor, to provide for our family, and I would argue that this requires us to be willing and able to do whatever necessary to safeguard our lives and the lives of others. Now, I know I got a little long-winded in this segment, and sometimes that happens. There's a whole lot more I probably could say on this subject, but we'll leave it there for this time. I would just leave you with this encouragement. Pray for our country and pray for the upcoming elections. Pray that faithful citizens will elect godly men and women to public office so that, Lord willing, the tide of liberalism and the erosion of our liberty 
can be stemmed and rolled back so that we can once again say with certainty that we live in a free nation and that freedom isn't something more than just an illusion. If you have any comments or questions, anything you would like me to pontificate about, please send your feedback through the feedback page at armlutheran.us. Christ's blessings to you all. Talk to you next time. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. Check out the Facebook page, The Armed Lutheran, or join our Facebook group, Fans of Armed Lutheran Radio. If you like what you hear, please leave us a comment on our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback or a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network.